yeah, I would say the best thing for a data scientist is learn to do a project start to finish because, I mean, I say the biggest thing when people first start out is they want to just take a data set and throw a bunch of models on them and like play with them. And when in reality, that's like 20% of the process. This episode of Ken's Nearest Neighbors is powered by Z by HP. HP's high compute, workstation grade, line of products and solutions. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Greg Watson. Greg is a content creator and sports enthusiast currently living in the Washington DC area. By day, he's a data scientist working for the IRS where he uses machine learning to detect fraud. After that, he can be found at local happy hours, watching the game and figuring out where to travel to next. In this episode, we learn how Greg landed a data science job with a less than stellar undergrad GPA we also learn about some of the differences between working in the public and private sector. I hope you enjoy the episode. Greg, thank you so much for joining me on the Ken's Nearest Neighbors podcast. I came across you on YouTube. I saw a couple of the interesting videos that you'd put out there and you know, things. one thing led to another and we were able to talk and I decided I had to have you on the podcast because you had such an interesting experience breaking into the data science field as well as having a fairly interesting role now working in the public sector. So again, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you were able to see some of my videos. Um, I know we had a common interest when it comes to um, doing sports analytics and things like that. So you were, it was, it's great to be here. You were definitely the first data science YouTuber that I uh, started checking out. So um, uh, it's great to be here. <clears throat> Incredible. And so for anyone who's a fan of the podcast, they know that I'm also a fan of origin stories. And I'd love to hear where you first got introduced to data or where that first initial spark was lit around this domain. Or was it something that, you know, you, you realized that you liked data over a slow progression? Um, well, actually, I'm definitely, uh, if you know me, I'm definitely a spark type of person. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely, um, things that I do, things that I do, I usually do them um, with passion. I either hate it or I do it with passion. I'm kind of that type of person. Um, but jumping into the origin, it definitely, um, it definitely took a little bit until I even knew what data science was because in college, um, let's say the first um, three years of college, I didn't even know what data science was. I was just, um, I was just a kid who had didn't pass the gateway classes become a mechie um did miserably trying to be a physics major and then kind of had to become a math major because i had taken a bunch of math classes and i wanted to graduate um like this decade so um <laughs> i had to uh i had to pretty much get a math degree and i was pretty much looking at what you can do with math degrees so um after looking around pretty much the main things that came through was computer science actuarial science and then this thing data science kept popping up so i actually did look into actuarial science and finance a little bit um it really wasn't for me um i kind of liked actuarial science which is some people say it's similar to data science just for insurance but um when i started looking into data science more um the more and more that i looked into it the more that i um that i started falling in love with the field um I really, um, I actually really did enjoy math and statistics. Um, I had started to learn programming and I was starting to enjoy it a lot. And just um, the ability to kind of work in any field and um, get information from like any set of data or pretty much um, being able to answer what, being able to answer any question you have, you know, in theory, um, just by digging through data and, using predictive modeling, all these things that I started learning about really started um, interesting me. So I, um, I started learning about the field um, and I, I said I didn't even know what it was until maybe my third year of college. Um, and then it was really my fifth year of college, um, my second senior year that I, um, that I decided, uh, yeah, I had a first senior year and a second senior year. <laughs> um, oh, but, a victory lap, but. Yeah, yeah, that's there a good are. way to realize the victory laugh. Um, that was when I really um, 
realized that I loved it, but I, it did take a little bit of convincing myself that I could actually make it in the field because there is, um, it's not a position you sign up for, you know, like, um, I think, uh, finance is a great field, but you can kind of get like an entry level finance job, just like, um, um, maybe like without knowing as much, but with data science, I knew I was going to have to become a lot better at programming. I knew I was going to have to learn machine learning and um, I knew I was going to have to learn a lot more math and statistics and probability theories and things like that. So I was, um, so I was pretty much kind of on the fence a little bit, but then when I realized like this is pretty much exactly what I do, then I pretty much just devoted myself to taking online courses to learn R and Python and then um, taking online courses to learn machine learning and doing my own side projects. And really the most research I probably did was how to actually get into the field, like what employers would want to see. Um, I spent a lot of time building up my portfolio um, where I, uh, my first project was actually comparing um, Michael Jordan, LeBron and uh, Kobe because um, something that I read said, you should um, work with data that you're very familiar with and passionate about. And I was like, that's easy. So um, took some NBA data sets, did a quick data science project on that. And um, I was able to then, um, after building a portfolio, I was actually able to get a data science internship on campus through a connection that I had um, through a, a network, um, through, um, I'm actually, I was actually close with the, um, the vice president of IT at UMBC, and he was able to put me on a data science team that was just starting out. So, um, it was me and two other people. And, um, that's where I started really get learning. Um, that's when I really started getting better at programming and learning, um, machine learning concepts. The project we were actually working on at first was we were creating a random forest that would um, predict the likelihood that a student would enroll in UMBC after being admitted. So, I mean, at the time when I, my first day sitting there, I didn't even know what a random forest was. You know, I um, only R coding that I had known was from like a few courses and a few stat classes. So it wasn't anything to like put together a project, but from that internship, I definitely, um, learned a lot about that um and then i was able to i worked there for a year um did a few other projects that are pretty interesting we would track um like student faculty rates and um, i would build a, do a lot more dashboarding and things like that but that's where i got most of my um data experience um when i was in college and then i was able to keep I'm expanding my skills and then graduation rolls around and um, or well, let me take a step back. So it's my uh, my second senior year. Um, I'm applying to internships and uh, I'm, no, I'm applying to jobs, excuse me. So I'm applying to jobs and I'm applying to data science jobs and like um, it's brutal out there. <laughs> so, I'm, um, you know, I have um, my only experience is um, that internship, which was great, but um a lot of employers want you to have like real world experience. So I don't have a lot of experience. My GPA was not that good. Um, and um, there was a lot of, yeah, I felt like my resume was just not being looked at a lot for a lot of data science positions. So i um, doing more research on how to break into the field. And what I preach a lot on my YouTube channel is to become a data analyst first, because um, that's one of the, that's the way that I got in. I found, I still remember reading the article that said, if you wanted to get in data science, you can be a data analyst first and then transition to. So I started applying to analyst jobs and I was having a lot more success. Um, and wow, by a lot more success, I mean, I got one job offer. Um, so I got that one job offer and um, it was at Merkle in uh, Columbia, Maryland which is a digital marketing company. So um, I, I think, yeah, it actually might've been the only in-person interview I got and they offered me the position. So um, I still, yeah, so they offered me the position. I was able to start working there. And from that position, um, 
I had a I had really good experiences. Um, I was able to learn R, Tableau, and um, especially SQL. I had no experience with SQL before, but I was able to learn a lot of um, data science tools um, and a lot about um, just a lot about things about working, dashboarding, um, working remotely, getting things done on time. I mean, working in teams. Um, and um, I did get a little bit of modeling experience too. Um, I was able to, um, I'd say I only built one model that wasn't even implemented, but I was able to um, be around the modeling process, understand what happens from start to finish and um, what goes into that. So, um, and then after about a year and a half, maybe a year and um, three months, then I applied to data science positions. And um, after, from that experience, I was able to, from my analyst experience and my internship experience, I was finally able to get a data science um, position. And while I was working as a data analyst, I was still studying data science concepts. Like I was still taking more courses about machine learning um, I completed the, I think it was like the IBM data science Coursera course, but I was still studying a lot for, um, technical interviews. And I think with the position I have now is that's what really helped me, um, land this position because the interview for the position I have now was very technical, pretty much. It was, uh, the interview was like a few introductions, then technical questions. Then if you did well on that, then they like got to know you, <laughs> but it's, um, but yeah, that was um, that's a rundown version, I guess, because there was a lot of stress and uh, hard times in uh, in that. But it was really just um, just pretty much about me just saying, okay, like this is gonna be a lot of work, but I really don't want to do anything else. And if I make it in this, like I'm gonna be pretty set. This is a great field to be in. So just, I guess, shoot for the stars. <laughs> yeah. And that's pretty much how I got into the field. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely dive into some of the challenges that you had on the way. But but mm -hmm. something that I noticed that you described in in that conversation there is that the majority of your learning, it seems like, obviously, you did the certificates, you, you, you did the outside learning, but it seemed like you took away a lot more from the projects, the internships, and your work experience than you may have from the the coursework and things like that that you took. Obviously, those things helped you with the interview and whatever it might be. But I think it's really interesting, and this is a common theme from a lot of people I've talked to, is that the amount that your work matters, the amount that you know there is some outcome associated with your work, which is a lot more common in internships and jobs, the, the learning curve, well, the, the amount that you learn also increases significantly. And I found that in my own work is that the projects that, that matter that I'm getting paid for that I'm, that I'm doing either for YouTube or for, or for my main job, those are the things I come away from I'm like, wow, that, that changed my perspective. I really grew from that experience. It was probably more difficult. It was definitely a lot more stressful, but that's in my mind, that kind of uh, compression chamber where things really happen. Uh, obviously, it's important to to learn things in a in a somewhat more formalized way from certificates or degree programs or whatever it might be. But the way that we apply those things, and in my mind, where the learning really takes off, is when it is applied. Yeah, yeah, I um I definitely agree with that. Um, yeah, I, um definitely with um a lot of the data science position comes a lot of things that aren't covered in courses. And all, just things that are related to, I guess, working in general, as far as um, a lot of with data science projects, you know, they have to serve a purpose. Um, they have to be better than the process already implemented. You know, with courses, you'll you'll learn a lot, but um, the stuff. Um, but it, if you if you do a project and it doesn't bring value to the business, then it's just wasted time. So there's a lot of things, like I guess you call them logistical things, that you have to think about that you learn on the job. And then, um, yeah, I would say the best thing for a data scientist is learn to do a project start to finish because, I mean, I say the biggest thing when people first start out is they 
want to just take a data set and throw a bunch of models on them and like play with them. And when in reality, that's like 20% of the process. So definitely, um, yeah, definitely it's like, um, you know, you don't um, make the NBA, but just by like watching basketball, you know, you got to get out there and do it. Um, and you still want to make it. <laughs> I, I like yeah. the NBA analogy. I think yeah. it ties in pretty well with the logistics you just described as a data scientist in industry, you you have to pass off your analysis at some point, right? You're getting data from somewhere. It's inevitably whatever you're going to build is going to be used by someone else. And when we're doing that with projects, it's a little bit harder to get that same feeling where um, like who is the end user or who is the other contributor to this project? I mean, mm -hmm. in industry, you're working with data engineers. You're sometimes working with software engineers. You're sometimes working with machine le learning engineers. You're sometimes working with uh, business stakeholders. And in basketball, if you're an unbelievable one-on-one -on -one player, you're just dominating the streets and every single park, it doesn't mean you're going to be a very good team player. And it means you probably won't be able to make the the NBA per se. I mean, you look at all of the talent, I think it was like the N1 mixtapes. I used to love those. Yeah, and you're yeah, like, yeah. wow, these guys are unbelievably talented, but their skill set is focused on a different type of game that's being played. And you have to learn the game. You have to learn industry. And that's, I think, a reason why a lot of people put so much focus on having real world work experience yeah. on the flip side of that i do still think you can show those skills through a project portfolio you know mm -hmm. something that i rarely see people doing is within data science working with other people on data science projects that to me is something that jumps off the page to me because you're going to be doing that at work if you can show that you can do that in your own environment that you're controlling that you're managing yourself that's an unbelievably valuable skill to showcase yeah yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. Uh, I agree with that completely. I like nice. that. And what analogy. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, it's Bringing it back it. to sports. Right. Well, yeah. I also, you know, kind of rewinding a little bit, I'd love to hear what the results of your, uh, your basketball analysis was. I was team LeBron. <laughs> so it was actually funny because, um, um, when I was doing it, it, it was, this was a very basic project. It was actually more like, it was actually more of um, exploratory data stuff because I was just starting out. There was nothing predictive, but um, so pretty much digging through the stats, um, I was looking again, LeBron, Kobe, and uh, MJ, but um, LeBron's numbers, I mean, as far as efficiency and um, other things like rebounding and assists were just way higher. He had a lot of categories that were just, way higher than um, anything Kobe or uh, Michael Jordan would put up, especially um, blocks or steals and things like that. And then even with the categories that I think MJ had the high, most points, LeBron was still like right there. So um, like I said, it's it's on my GitHub somewhere. It was a, it was a very basic explore core data stuff. And then the thing that got me was Kobe's efficiency numbers were just like way down. And that hurt me. Yeah. Oh, I have a Kobe poster right here, but yeah, I'm a big uh, Kobe guy, but it was, um, it was a, a very fun product to do. If, if people are doing projects, I would recommend doing something that's going to be actually fun and enjoyable for you to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I also think that, a project is partly a function of the story you tell associated with it. I made a YouTube short about this recently and yeah. something like that. That's a question a lot of people are asking, right? If you mm -hmm. get someone that's even remotely interested in basketball and they see that on your resume, they're going to want to know what the findings were. They're going to want to ask you about that. They're going to want to understand that better. And it's okay that it's just a descriptive analysis, right? You're like, yeah. I, I don't see how in that scenario, you could make it a predictive analysis unless you're trying to evaluate like how their careers would have gone if they each played five more years or, or if they're playing yeah. in the same time or whatever it might be. But I, I think that understanding the use case, understanding the problem, understanding the story you're trying to tell also shows some really important skills. And, and it's also like a, you know, a fun thing for you and a fun thing for other people. Yeah. There was something, a product that I wanted to do that, um, that I wanted to be predictive where it was kind of take 
young players and uh, kind of project how their careers would go out. But I, I ultimately never did it because I thought it would be too biased, kind of. Um, because I was thinking about, I remember it was at the time, it was um, trying to predict how, I guess, two or three years ago, how uh, like a young Jason Tatum's career would go. But the way I thought about doing it was comparing it to similar players. But I couldn't figure out a way to do that without me kind of handpicking similar players. I guess I could have looked at similar players who had similar rookie stats. But, um, yeah, I just thought there would be um, – it's not something that definitely can't be done. Maybe maybe somebody will do it. It will be crazy accurate. Um, and I should have done it. But um, I just thought that um, I would probably be very biased when, when doing – when selecting the data set, but um, yeah, definitely hoping to keep doing more predictive stuff in the, in the future. Now that I have a lot more uh, machine learning experience. For sure. I think you could do something like that. If you just did some clustering around him and other, and a lot of other people from the like rookie season or college stats, and then use those yeah. as a proxy. Uh, there's a, within golf, there's a company or a website called data golf. And they do projections for every PGA Tour player about what they're expecting yeah. their career to look like, and it's really cool. Um, yeah. Maybe one day I'll have them on the podcast. That'd be that'd be kind of yeah, cool. be, yeah. It'd be great to know how how they how they do that. Yeah, because there's a lot go. of I think the whole sports analytics, especially um, sports betting analytics, is is really uh, on the is really growing now. Absolutely. And I think it seems like sports are becoming a lot more okay with it. They're realizing it's an inevitability, yeah. which is which is also nice. I think that there's a lot of opportunities in the data space related to that as well, which for me is extremely exciting. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to kind of dive back into your career journey a little bit and talk about some of the difficulties that you had breaking in. Obviously, in your short story, it sounded very like methodical and, you know, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. <laughs> But I know for a fact that most of the time, you know, that's not what's going through your head. That's not what the feelings and emotions you're experiencing as you go through uh, a really challenging thing, which is to break into this field. What were some of the the biggest roadblocks you saw? What were some of the things that helped you get through those? Um, I would say the biggest roadblocks whew, is just um, a lot of it was um as far as uh, as far as physical um there was things about actually getting the job um like i said i hadn't done well up to that point um and i think a lot of it was because i really had no reason i like had no purpose in school i didn't i wasn't doing well i didn't feel like i had a purpose when i realized that i wanted to get in data science my grades went from um i think i went from like um, I brought, I brought my GPA up a lot, but there were some semesters, like when I first started college that I was actually on like, uh, academic probation. And I went from that to, um, my last two years, maybe having like a 3.6 or something, taking like mostly math classes. So a lot of it was, um, I guess finding a purpose that's part of it. But, um, back to the physical was just, um, I didn't, I didn't have a great GPA. I finished with like a 2.8 or something. So that was hard to um, sell to some jobs, um, a lot of the big boys. Um, and definitely, I would say another thing overcoming is just, um, and I, it wasn't really the grind because I, I really did enjoy learning about it, but um, I think it was just like being, being, um, believing that um this was all gonna pay off one day and like um let's say when i was and being a data analyst that i wasn't just working here and i was just always gonna be an analyst and never gonna be um a data scientist um but i did um yeah i i think um a lot of that is just believing that it all worked out because i think from the time that like i'm in college to the time I land my first actual data science position might have been about three years. So I think um, a lot of that is just believing that this next level is going to bring me to the next level, which is going to bring me to the next level. Um, yeah, um, I, I would say that that those were a few of the um, 
the difficulties I had. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny. I had a very s- similar experience grade wise. So I was not a very good college student when I started out. Yeah. I had a, uh, I think I had like a two point five GPA or something like that in my first yeah. year of college. And then I transferred schools and I graduated like a three point nine. Uh, which is yeah. a hack for oh, really? people in the U.S. is yeah. that you don't have to talk about your previous GPA at another school if you transfer. Oh, really? Um, I wish I knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty sneaky. Really? And then yeah. grad school, I've, I, I performed exceedingly well. But the thing That's is great. that after those first couple years, I found that I could apply a lot of the things that I was learning within my, my major at the time, which was... Uh, I think it was economics. It was either business administration or economics to my golf game. And I had purpose for studying and learning these things and I became obsessed. And it's one of these things where if you can find a compelling reason, and I don't necessarily think a compelling reason is to just become a data scientist. To me, that's, it's like, okay, that's a great profession and and it is a, a good thing to strive for. But at the same time, once you land that role, you lose kind of a lot of your steam. And I think mm-hmm. that striving to, to look past what that career is, and I think being a data scientist is an incredible motivator uh, or incredible goal in the like short, medium term. But as we continue to learn setting goals that are even beyond that, it's that, okay, well, you know, I want to learn these things to be able to, um, you know, for, for me and, and very much like yourself that you'd mentioned before, it's being able to solve or have a framework for solving any of the problems or questions that arise in my life or being able to tackle any of those things, not just in my work domain, but in my own, whatever domain it is, whether it's an entrepreneurial venture, whether it's a change I want to incite in myself from analyzing my own data, that to, that to me is unbelievably fascinating and exciting. So um, I, I'm interested to know if, aside from just loving the field and and i think that you can also have a passion for learning the the field mm-hmm. as well it's like learning data science was there something beyond just landing that role or was the the role your main fo- focus through that journey and then you know if that is the case what happened once you landed that role um hmm um a deep question i know yeah, I mean, I would love to tell you and say, I would love to sit up here and say that I had a passion for data science so I could use it to solve world hunger or something, but, <laughs> you know, um, no, I've always, I mean, I've always wanted to get into sports analytics, but a lot of it was pretty much what you said, just me loving the field and um, really wanting to get that position. I can't, uh, yeah, I can't really think of like a, a greater purpose other than maybe just to to prove to myself that um i could jump really high you know um that i could um that i could shoot for the stars and actually make it sometimes because um you know i'm I'm gonna shoot for the stars land among the clouds but usually you land among clouds or usually i would land among clouds never actually read the stars so it was something to kind of prove to myself that um i've never done I've, I've done decent in school um especially in high school i did pretty well um i never really enjoyed school though or and i wasn't doing that well in college and that was always the field of my life that like um i i guess embarrassed about or i didn't do well and it was holding me back but for me to get a data science job i would kind of have to su- succeed directly in that kind of intellectual side um, which is knowing, um, which is being able to study really well, read really well, um, be disciplined, be focused with the studies to get there. That's something that I always struggle with. So for me to like land this job, I would have to go through that gate. And that would mean, that did mean a lot to me because that's something that I always struggled with. I was always good at other things like, um, you know, like I was just, just always, always good at other things like, um, that I would um, set my mind to, but the the academic part I always uh, struggled with. So it meant something to me to actually make it in that regard. I really like that. I I mean, honestly, I I did something similar with pursuing my master's in computer science. So Mm -hmm. 
I had barely written a line of code before I decided to do that program. And obviously yeah. I did quite a bit of studying before I entered it, but that's something that I viewed as one of the most difficult things that I could do is taking on this incredible intellectual challenge without having that much experience in it. And if I could do that, then I could do anything. You know, if I could get through mm -hmm. a hurdle like that or learning a completely new domain, to me, that draws some some lines in the sands for you for you to realize that you are really capable of a lot of things. And we build on those experiences. And I think it's it's really important the way you frame that is that it's, you know, if you can do this, you know, what what else could you be capable of? Rather mm -hmm. than if I can do this, then I'm done. You know what I mean? I think a lot, there's a lot of burnout in data science because it's so hard to get these roles. The interview process is so brutal. And then once people land the role, they're kind of like, that's it. And, yeah. uh, and, you know, I mean, like that's, that's the nature of the game, but that's also, I think a little bit of a function of the mindset that, that people have when going in. It's that, okay, I've made it, you know, now I should, you know, I make this good salary, whatever it is, but you forget you have to do the work and you forget that yeah. you still have to continue to grow and continue to learn. And so again, the way you framed it there, where this is a, uh, like proving to yourself that you're capable of, of great things or accomplishing this, you know, for, for a lot of people, this monumental task, including yourself, um, mm -hmm. to me, I, I really like that. And I think that's an incredible way to motivate yourself to do other incredible things. This episode is brought to you by Z by HP, HP's high compute, workstation grade line of products and solutions. As data sets get larger, unraveling meaningful insights can become more time consuming and costly. Z is specifically made for high performance data science solutions. And I personally use the ZBook Studio and the Z4 workstation. I really love that Z workstations can come standard with Linux and they can be configured with the data science software stack. With the software stack, you can get right to the work of doing data science on day one without the overhead of completely reconfiguring your new machine. These powerful machines are being used to solve real world problems as well. If you're a student and you wanna get your hands on one of these, there's a great opportunity right this second. HP is hosting a Kaggle competition to identify and localize COVID-19 anomalies. And the student team that scores the highest will receive a top of the line ZBook Studio. Now back to our episode. Awesome. So I'd like to also dive into the data analyst to data scientist progression. Okay you know, what skills did you feel like you needed to develop further to make that shift? Was it just a function of time? You pretty much knew everything you needed to know, or was it uh, like interviewing capabilities? Was it building out your resume? What was it that, that was that missing piece in that step? Okay, so you mean talking about um, going from my, my analyst position to my data science position? Um, yeah, the, the data analyst position did help me to check a lot of main boxes. Um, like SQL, that was a main box. Um, R programming, I knew I was able to get a little bit of that. Um, and um, Tableau really helped a lot. Knowing knowing Tableau helped a lot. But um, the things that I really needed to keep working on were um, other machine learning concepts. And um, even though I I did. I had a, I was exposed to R as an analyst. I pretty much just ran other people's scripts. Um, I didn't really um, develop my own. So definitely developing, definitely I still needed to get my, uh, my technical skills up a lot. Um, I definitely, so I definitely need to get my technical skills up a lot. And then um, I think maybe the biggest one was uh, statistical knowledge, because I, I was a math major, so I had good stat background. But um, that's something that you kind of need to keep practicing, uh, or at least for me, um, you know, you you need to keep practicing and um, keep um, keep that stuff in your memory, because certain things you learned in college will probably disappear within a year. And um, then having to go back and study that for um, interviews and things like that was um, was a, a lot more of a challenge. And um, of course, like I said, I, I had some experience with modeling, but um, it, it was really not very hands-on. It was pretty much just helping other people run their models. Um, and um, it, and by uh, what I say that, um, just so people know, it's pretty much like taking the output of their model and doing something with it. 
um, where you get to learn a little bit about the model, but of course there's a whole lot that you're missing or formatting, helping them format the inputs or something like that, or learning how this actually helps, how it's run. Um, that's a lot that, that, um, that took a lot to learn. As I'm talking, I actually keep remembering more things that I had to learn. So another thing, um, I was a math major. I did not take many comp sci classes. So I remember showing up to my first day um, at Merkel at my data analyst job. And they said, oh, blah, blah, blah. We're running this on the server. And I was like, OK. And I was like, wait a minute. I actually don't really know what a server is. <laughs> and I had to Google what a server is. Oh, it's a computer somewhere else. But um, there's a lot of the, um, a lot of what you need to know in data science has to do kind of about computer knowledge. I won't say you have to know hardware knowledge crazy, but you're going to have to work with um, a lot. You're going to have to know um, like pretty much how much memory your model is taking up, like, um, um, how many gigabytes of data your files are, just other other kind of computer related um, terminologies and things that um, you might have not realized you need to know pretty much. Like working with PuTTY, um, SSH stuff, um, connecting to the database um, drivers, you know, all, the, all those all those things that they might even, you might, if you're looking about data science stuff, they're, how to get into data science, they probably won't even cover that stuff. But that's um, that was a big jump right there is, um, I guess, that aspect of computer and technical knowledge, which I'm, I, I'm still very, very fuzzy with that stuff, too. I usually need a lot of help when um, I still need a lot of help with that. That's not my background. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that there is just so much in work where you're reading between the lines. There's the way that data science, the way that education in general is, is we focus on the big and the important concepts. But mm -hmm. with work, it's kind of death by a thousand little needles because there's so many little things that you don't think about or you don't realize is that, okay, like, where is yeah. this data being stored? Or do I have to get access to this database from someone in a different department? Or, you know, like, what are the ethical implications of looking at this person's data in this certain way? To me, it's a really, uh, you know, there's just so much that comes with it that, again, like you want to try and find these real world experiences because that comes through in an interview, that comes through in a conversation. If you know how the real work is being done and what that experience is like. W one thing I would like to ask about that data analyst uh, transition, it seems like you're still learning quite a bit as a data analyst. You're doing courses. I'm assuming you're doing some projects and things like that. How did you balance time? I see you have this giant whiteboard behind you. Is that a part <laughs> of it? What is, you know, how, how did you manage to continue to learn when you were working full time as well? Um, yeah, the whiteboard is a new thing. Definitely should have had one at the time. Um, so, man, I'm not going to sit here and act like a, uh, like a genie coming to comps to time management. It was... I would say a lot of, um, for the year and a half that I was working at Merkle, um, for the first six months, I probably wasn't doing any extra stuff. I was just trying to learn my job. Uh, maybe even the first nine months, something like that. But then towards the end of it, that's when I would have to put in the hours at work. And then I have to pretty much, I would take a break, you know, eat dinner, um, do something. Um, but then um, again, from pretty much that block at night, maybe seven to nine or something like that. Um, maybe, maybe not even that, maybe seven to eight. I would say like seven to eight, maybe just an hour every day, just consistently for a few months. That's where I was able to gain a lot of knowledge. Um, so for me, I learned that I can't like just cram a bunch of knowledge and know it. Like I needed to put even, even if it's 10 minutes a day, um, I would um, I would just look up a concept. I would just like say like, okay, let me think of something I heard that I don't know what it means. Um, like uh, recall. I don't know what recall is. So I, I would look up what recall means. And my goal was just to learn like one thing a day. And um, I actually meant to put a video about it, but it's I um another way that I made it very efficient was learning was I would surround myself with data knowledge. So 
Um, I spent a lot of time on Instagram. Um, I spent a lot of time on Facebook, probably way too much time. But what I would do is I would, on Instagram, I would just follow data science accounts. And I would follow these accounts that would like put a post that would just explain regression or explain some data science concept. Um, on Facebook, I would follow the same thing. So as you're scrolling, you're gonna see a post and I'll be like, okay, you see this post, just read it real quick and then go back to scrolling. So you keep, and that was a very good way to learn because you're just learning in that time where you're just, you know, BSing on Instagram, you actually, oh, what is this? You learn something real quick and it just keeps adding um, adding up. So I just find ways to, um, to find ways to really um, learn. And I, um, oh, I found, what was it? When I was in the car, I would listen to like data science audio books on um, Spotify. So that's another way that I didn't, that's another way I didn't take time out of anything else. Um, and I was able to still continue like learning every day. I would just listen to like a something that would explain, I think it was like, I know there's the super data science podcast and there was another one, but it was literally called like machine learning something. And every episode was just an odd, the guy explaining machine learning concepts to you um, while you're in the car. So that's something that's not going to take any time out of your day. Cause you're already in the car. You're already scrolling through Instagram and uh, you get just knowledge shoved into your brain when it wouldn't be. So those were two, like two people did. Yeah. Well, there, there are a couple of really cool things I think people can take away from that is that one, I have this ongoing battle with social media and it's really mm -hmm. powerful to be able to make social media work for you. So if you're thinking about Twitter, you're thinking about Instagram, essentially making another account or in your account, only following accounts that are like you would deem beneficial or adding value rather than detracting mm -hmm. in terms of like eyeball minute share and those types of things. Um, yeah. Also, I'm a huge believer in getting economies of scope. So that means that, you know, when you're driving, you're also doing something else. Not, not that would take your eyes mm -hmm. off the road, but you know, when, yeah. when you're in transit, when you're, when you're working on something else, you're also still able to, to fill your brain with, with knowledge or, or to grow or, or to do whatever it is. I mean, the same thing goes for me is that like, let's say I shoot a bunch of clips for a video. I can then reuse those clips for another video if if I if I like them or they fit the scenario and eventually I'll have this huge mm -hmm. library of different video clips that I can use for a bunch of different things and I could even maybe put some of those video clips on like story blocks or whatever one of these other platforms that allow me to monetize mm -hmm. them when I'm not using but the idea is we're getting a lot of use out of a single thing um, mm -hmm. I mean to me that's a really important thing the other thing you mentioned about the daily habit, that's something I obviously am very passionate about with my 66 days of data initiative. That's something that mm -hmm. uh, creating those habits and, and scheduling time to work is something that I think is really powerful. And the way you described it is if you're learning one thing every day or you're learning, let's say one different machine learning model each week, over the course of a year, you're gonna have a pretty good understanding of what 50, 52 different machine learning models and I think that that's probably significantly more than most data scientists have, right? right. Uh, you know, I, I, I think that on a, on a yearly, annual or biannual basis, I don't use more than that many different types of algorithms or approaches or whatever it might be. So creating those things and realizing that they, they pay off over a longer time period is unbelievably valuable. I mean, everyone wants to know everything right now but you just described your career and your progression over the course of three years, becoming a data scientist from a college student. Mm -hmm. And it is a progression, right? It's not like we learned this in snap overnight, we're a data scientist. It, it, mm -hmm. It's a very cool thing to see that, you know, obviously we we'll want to get to a destination faster, but these things become a lot more feasible. They become a lot more real if we look at them over a slightly long period of time. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, I do also want to touch on your current role. So you're obviously in the public sector working as a data scientist, and I'd love to understand what the nature of that work is, how that is different perhaps from private sector. Uh, I'd also like to understand, I would imagine with your line of work, you're doing more anomaly detection, uh, those types of things, and how you approach those problems different than perhaps a more traditional data science problem. Cool. Um, 
Yeah, um, going from the private sector to the public sector was something that I never thought I would do. Um, my my father actually worked in the public sector, like um, I guess the well, I don't know, last ten years of his life, I guess. But he, um, so I knew I knew the benefits of of that, where like there was a lot of stability and stuff, but. Um, the reason I really got into it was because I was working for Hilton Hotels during um, the coronavirus. And when the coronavirus hit, um, I think 85% of employees were laid off. So now I'm jobless in a recession, in a global pandemic. And the only people that have contracts that are hiring is the government. So yeah, the stability is crazy. So, um, and I actually like um, got god bless me but i was able to find a job let's see like two months after being laid off um which is crazy for a recession like that but um i was able to be hired about two months after laid off and um you know i was um i wasn't living in my parents house you know i have rent and everything and money just coming out of my account you know so i'm like you know this is a blessing so i um i accept this job and um when I was hired, I knew I'd be contracted to the government, but I didn't really know where until I think maybe the last round of the interview. But pretty much what I do is I do fraud detection for the IRS. Um, so it's actually, I'm on a small team. We do internal fraud detection um, and we monitor um, the activity of IRS employees um, relating to um, tax returns, pretty much. So one of the funny things that we monitor is um, we make sure that like they're not accessing returns of people that they shouldn't. And one of the most flagged things is people looking up celebrity tax returns just to see like how much they owe. And the most common one is people looking up Donald T Trump's tax returns, which happens all the time. Thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's something that we have to flag a lot. Um, so we have a team of people who just kind of um, they are. Um, Pretty much like that. That's a no, no. You, you you look up Donald Trump's tax return. That's a no, no. Like an analyst will flag that and you'll be flagged. But then there's um, the predictive analytics team where we look at things that are um, less concrete, more um, more pattern based. And that's where a lot of um, we use a lot of anomaly um, detection algorithms like um, auto encoders and isolation forests, which um, are pretty much used to look at, let's say, um, people accessing a weird volume of um, of um, tax returns in a week, maybe in a day. Um, so that's um, related to volume. And then I have one um, that's I, I run that's actually related to sequential patterns, where they're accessing um, taxpayer tins in a sort of pattern. Um, based um, relations. So definitely in the in the private, I mean the public, excuse me, private, private, um, a lot of the machine learning I did, I was on a revenue team for Hilton. We were predicting, you know, revenue, forecasting how many rooms would be booked. It's all supervised learning stuff. The data you're training is all labeled. For this, it's all unsupervised, meaning we just have records. We just pretty, have, pretty much have people's activity data and we have to find anomalous patterns in that. So like I said, we're using autoencoders, um, which is a type of um, neural network, which kind of, I don't know if I can, how well I can explain it right here, but it pretty much shrinks down the data and it tries to recreate the data. Again, this is, this is probably a terrible thing, but, um, but the, when it shrinks down the data and, it, um, and if it's not able to recreate the data, then it's a sign that it's anomalous. And then we have um, another one that's an isolation forest which is a which is based off a random forest but it's actually um when it creates the forest it uses the lengths of the actual branches of the tree to um find anomalies so it's um those are two algorithms that i don't i'd never heard of before oh, i i knew i kind of heard of autoencoders but i would never heard of isolation forest before um even even when studying data science i never heard of isolation forest before um, working in fraud detection. And um, a lot of the problems we face have very creative solutions. 
So one of the things that we're working on is um, pretty much derived just from having a problem and then trying to figure out um, a solution. So one of the problems they saw was that they found somebody who was accessing tax filer IDs like TINs in a sequential pattern. So pretty much when you're accessing, like let's say a TIN is just a series of numbers, like a personal identification number. So like it's similar to a phone number. So if you were gonna call a bunch of random phone numbers, the phone numbers would all be random, like not related to each other. If you're gonna pick them out of a hat, um, they would all be random. But if you started picking them out of the hat and the last de digits of the first one was like 01 and the next one was 02 and then 03, 04, 05, 06, 07, 08, and there was like a pattern, you'd be like, okay, this is suspicious. So we were seeing that and how people were accessing taxpayer numbers. Like why is all the taxpayer numbers that they're accessing, why is there a pattern in that? Um, so we had to create an algorithm that would find that. Um, and the way we actually did that is um, me and my coworker, we built an LSTM that actually does that, which is actually pretty dope because we only based it off of um, only one research paper that we saw. It's pretty innovative, but it's pretty much, it takes all the unsupervised data that we have with no labels and we pretty much um, make a fake data set um, that looks like that and then we label what we want the, the model to pick up as um, as patterns in the data so we pretty much create artificial data with labels train it on that and convert kind of an unsupervised problem to a supervised problem um, and the um, which I was a little sketchy of at first, um, but we created this artificial training set and then we trained it on real world data and it's performing phenomenal actually. It's um it's um able to catch all these sequential patterns that were appearing and more and um it's really um it's really working out well and really um looking good through all the tests that we've performed. So that was probably the most fun thing I've done, which was just having this solution that we pretty much drummed up and seeing it actually working um, working very well. But um, yeah, the unsupervised learning is a, is a, it's a different monster. <laughs> but um, there's, there's a lot of cool things you can do. Yeah, I think one of the really cool things is that the nature of data science work, the algorithms you use, the use cases, they vary so much by domain. And within the public sector, if you're really thinking about it, you're almost never focused on, on forecasting revenues. It's all reducing costs and it's all about efficiency. And the mindset, the types of problems you're trying to face are a little bit different associated with that. And if you're someone who really likes optimization, it might be really well suited for you, right? Especially depending on the yeah. types of problems. I also find it really interesting that a lot of the time and resources are focused on auditing IRS employees. That to me is very fascinating. Mostly, usually we're trying to understand our customers, but for the government to a certain extent, like the customers are the US population, but the customers are also the employees in a kind of weird, weird mm -hmm. dynamic system. If you look at like, for example, the PJ Tour, technically a nonprofit, technically also the Players Association. So they play yeah. the, they pay the players, but they also represent them. And it's a very weird kind of system where analytics get get very interesting as well. So I, I think that that's a, a, a fascinating, fascinating, maybe idiosyncrasy of that line of work. Um, and I'm wondering if, if, you know, that's like weird. It's like oh, our work is auditing employees or is that just like, oh, like this is necessary because the system is so large. Yeah. Awesome. Well, those are all the questions that I had for you. Um, I, actually, let's let's talk just a little bit more on the the uh, the uh, content creation front. So you have a, a YouTube channel called Data Life. I've watched mm -hmm. quite a few of your videos. I very much enjoyed the the sports analytics one that you made, the uh, NFL playoff prediction, and I think that's one of the reasons why I reached out to you. And I'd love mm -hmm. to hear about your experience creating, and also what what prompted you to start doing that in the first place. Um, hmm. uh, what prompted me, um, 
probably me just uh, trying to predict games and win some money. That's probably what prompted me. <laughs> um, but um, what prompted me is I've always been a huge sports guy, and um, um, there's a lot of data in sports, and I'm also a huge data guy. So um, it was really me, a lot of me wanting to be able to predict NFL games um, and see um, is there – a way to do this with um, data. Because it's funny, because I'm a big data guy, I'm a big sports guy, but I, I, like, I was never that much of a believer in sports data, like statistics. Um, I think they're a little overrated in some case. Like sometimes people look at stats way too much when looking at players and teams and things like that. So I'm thinking like, is there, Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe is there a way to actually call and predict outcomes of football games extremely accurately using um, data? So I wanted to test that out as best as I could. And um, I remember from that one, I had models that actually performed pretty well. I think the best one performed did, got like eight or nine out of 12 games correctly, which... Um, was pretty well. I think the worst one got like six out of 12, which is um, not effective because it's the same as flipping a, a coin. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wanted to see if there was any basis for it. And it looks like there was. So I would predict the the game, the score, and like the over under based on, on the score. And um, it was pretty effective. I don't know if I would actually put money on it because um, I lost too much money sports betting already, <laughs> but uh, yeah. Um, but it was just something. It was very fun. It was very, um, very interesting. I think there is a lot of basis. And as I was working on the project, I, it just became more interesting. Wondering what, you know, the, the guys at the top are are doing. The guys who are they're nine to five and they spend all year creating these sports prediction models. What they're doing differently. And um, I stumbled across your video from years ago when you started talking about, I think it was Monte Carlo simulations um, of how you were doing it, which was a completely different approach of how I did it. And I was like, wow, okay. So that's another, that's a completely different approach than what I was doing that maybe that's better. You know, we got to, you know, test it out and see. Um, but there's a lot um, going on into that field. It's like, um, for me, I, um, for me, I always think I'm trying to predict the unpredictable. You know, sports are unpredictable. You know, everybody says sports are unpredictable, but um, maybe they're not as unpredictable as I thought or as anyone thought. Yeah. Well, you know, I think it's a very interesting question. I mean, I don't think any model ever will be able to predict sports outcomes with perfect certainty because of how much randomness is involved. But the question mm -hmm. that we're always seeking is, can we predict the outcomes more consistently than a sports book after they've taken mm -hmm. juice. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that can be done. And, you know, we're, we're saying for creating probability dis distributions rather than discrete, discrete outcomes, that's something that opens up an entirely new world is that, Hey, can we find a 5% edge here, a 10% edge here? And, you know, we're still going to lose a lot. <laughs> But can we win a little bit more than we lose? That's a fascinating question to me. Uh, I've also found the more I, I look into sports betting, the more I look into a lot of these fast moving domains, a lot of this is about volume. And, you know, do I think if I was betting across a bunch of different games, a bunch of different prop bets, a bunch of different things, you know, $50,000 a weekend, mm -hmm. I actually think I'd have better odds of winning because I would be hedged across multiple different things and I'd be able to like create more surplus that way. I, I see something very similar with uh, like, like uh, a trading algorithms, right? Where you're, yeah. you, have, you have to pay trading fees and the amount that you profit only works at scale uh, because the trading fees are a certain amount or you're losing time yeah. or whatever it might be. And so uh, it's, it's a very interesting problem and it's something that I'm always looking to understand better. I mean, I can't really bet on sports right now in, in my line of work or it's a very, I think it's legal, but also a, a bit of a, a ethical gray area. Um, yeah. But 
No, it's an unbelievably interesting question and it does make for pretty fascinating, interesting content. Yeah. So your, your company does uh, sports betting? No. So or we do analytics? advising on player performance and team oh, performance. Okay. So we have oh. access to a bunch of the, the, the data sources that are available to the teams and leagues. And it, it, while it would, again, be legal for us to use those in those domains, it's also, um, it might go against some terms of service or it might go against some of those other things where we want to have access to, to this data still, right? So I, I yeah. think that that's one of the, the main constraints for us there. Yeah, awesome. Sounds really interesting. Yeah. Awesome. This was a lot of fun. I'm glad we got to chat. I think we told some pretty interesting stories, especially, you know, going yeah. from a, a 2.6 GPA to becoming a data scientist. To me, that's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. a pretty compelling accomplishment. Um, yeah. You know, also understanding what it's like to work in, in public sector for the government is something that I am not privy to on a day-to-day -day basis. And it sounds really awesome, the types of problems that you're able to approach and solve. So I wanted mm -hmm. to thank you one last time for coming in and, and uh, I really appreciate it.